next speaker today is a man who needs no introduction in our times, Mr. Tamil Bandipadhyay. Someone who has been respected for his levels of competence, integrity and humility. He started off his journalism career in 1985 and since then has worked with four national financial dailies including Economic Times, Business Standard, The Financial Express and uh, uh, Mint. So he is also the founding editor of uh, Mint. He has authored three books including Sahara, The Untold Story, is instrumental in the Sahara Exposes, which eventually led to a 200 crore case being filed. A man of extreme courage and fearlessness. He has also been associated as an advisor uh, with Bandhan Banks. It's an extremely successful model of uh, extending the credit line to the last mile. So I request Mr. Tamil Pandipadhyay to start off with some of his experiences, his personal journey, anecdotes from the same, and then uh, guide us with the guide us towards the journey of Bandhan Banks, the experiences, the model at which it operates, and the learnings that we can derive from that. So please welcome Mr. Tamal Bandhapadhyay with a huge round of applause. Thank you. Amun uh, said that I should talk about we talk my personal journey first, and then talk about uh, Bandhan uh, model and financial inclusion, so on. So it's embarrassing to talk about personal journey unless you are a Nobel laureate or some really important person. So I am a, a journalist by accident, I would say. And what I do today, uh, or I have been doing for the past two decades, have nothing to do with what I've learned. Uh, and this is probably uh, um, maybe some use for you guys in your career choice also. Well, I'm a student of English literature. I studied uh, Sally Keats, Byron Shakespeare. Uh, uh, I was into theater. I was. Uh, planning to do my PhD uh, uh, in absurd, uh, for on absurd drama, so on and so forth. And today I have been dealing with uh, finance. I write books on finance and people think that I know a lot of finance, which is not correct exactly. So uh, why have I done it and what, uh, why I have done it as I said by accident and um, why I have become, I would think that I can earn my bread uh, doing this is simply I personally feel, uh, you know, what we learn in school and colleges, very often uh, what we do later in our life, there is not much of connection between them. Uh, this is one way of looking at it. And other way of looking at it is uh, just not uh, think that education we can only have in schools and colleges. Actually, we can learn every day from our colleagues, from the external environment, and so on. So in my case, I think I have chosen the second one. To, uh, act, it's, I, have, I don't have any degree on finance or anything. It's just my, I think the way to do look at it is the two prime ingredients to do things, uh, whatever you do, is uh, common sense and curiosity. Uh, yes, we need uh, dedication, we need commitment, we need intelligence, we need perseverance, we need tenacity, so on and so forth. But uh, if you ask me the two critical factors to do things, reasonably successfully is these two C's, common sense and curiosity. Rest are all others in the you know, outer layers, that intelligence, dedication, and of course, governance, ethics, uh, uh, kindness, so on and so forth. But these two things are very, very critical. Unless we are into, into micro something, like I can't become a scientist or I can't become a doctor, which really needs the, that specific micro, micro knowledge. But broadly, I mean, I could have been a lawyer, I could have been a public speaker, I could have been a politician, I could have been an IS, I could have been this areas. I mean, I meaning any of you, if you have these two, uh, common sense and curiosity. Uh, so I, actually my brother, elder brother was in, in civil service, so I tried, but I failed. First time I could not make it at all. Second time I failed in the, in the viva, you know, that um, uh, oral, this thing. So it was very embarrassing. So then somebody suggested that why don't you try Times of India? It is even more important and more prestigious than IS. Times of India journalism, I'm talking about 32 years back uh, to the 1985. Those days there was no business school, no media school. Times used to pick up following the IES model, people through stringent exam, etc., etc., uh, pick up some people and uh, train them into various segments of journalism. 
and after one year it is up to it was up to times to absorb them or based on the times uh, one year stamp they could get job anywhere else and of course subsequently they dismantled the system they uh, opened their own school and started teaching so i, I was i belong to the last batch of this particular segment so and uh, whatever i ended up being selected and first day i saw there are uh, you know i and i had nobody in uh, in bombay so i um, uh, they used to give second class fare of course before that for interviews and all we came and i came there and picked up my bag i mean kept my bag in the whatever you call it the where you see in the train uh, where you um, sorry a cloak room i got this then i took bath there and i came out of if you are familiar with bombay on the so times of india is on the other side of vt station and vt station said one way uh, the entry and exits on the times of india side and other way is the gpo side so i got out of the gpo side and i remember i think i polished my boot i was wearing a black shoes for 2 or 2 rupees or something and then which actually is a 30 second walk crossing the road i took a taxi and the taxi took me some way and brought to Times of India. One and a half rupees taxi fare. So I got there and uh, we had the first day session, uh, etc. workshop. And at the end of the day at five o'clock, our training officer was a gentleman called Mr. Patanjali Sethi and his secretary was Mr. Ganeshan. Patanjali Sethi was, if you have seen Sole, there's a character who says that Tera kya hoga re kaliya, Samma somebody. So Padanjali said he was look, is to look like that. <laughs> so after four, five o'clock when the, this thing, I never knew where to go. So, and Mr. Sethi went into his room and Ganeshan was guarding his secretary. So I told him, I want to desperately meet Mr. Sethi. I have some personal thing to ask. He said, what is this? I said, no, it's very personal. I have to ask him something. So very reluctantly, he let me in. And then uh, I asked, sir, where do I stay? He said, where are you staying? I said, I kept my bag in the cloak room and uh, now I have to stay. He said, this is a part of your training. You have to look for a, a place on your own. So I, <laughs> I went back. I <laughs> spent the night at the station and saw all the advertisements, you know, looking for uh, where you can stay and all. And then next morning, I started calling up people and all and I got into it. So that's how I made my journey. And initially, I was doing all, you know, theater review and writing on alcoholic anonymous and uh, narcotics anonymous because I don't have, I did not have any expertise in finance. I never knew that I would do it. Uh, so that was the case and it was interesting. Uh, and then one fine morning, sometime in 90s, even 91, uh, I think many of you are the children of liberalization, you know, 91 India opened up. I was, I mean, I knew as a just uh, what is happening in India and all, but as a journalist, I had no connection with those economic changes and all because I was not into business journalism. And then sometime mid-90s, uh, one of my editor asked me that there is a vacancy uh, in business journalism and you have to find out banking. Would you like to do this? Uh, I said, why not? Let me try. Uh, it's interesting. So that's how I got in and I found it very interesting because I found that uh, you know, there are different pieces. It's uh, banking, then economy, then foreign exchange market, then uh, debt market, and then bond market, and of course credit, deposit, people's lives, corporate India and all. So I started seeing the, the larger picture and it's all connecting the dots. So I found it, even though as I said, I was a student of English literature, so uh, I found it interesting. And what I did, which many people don't do probably, I started asking stupid questions. Because many of the time we feel this very embarrassed, even if we don't know, shall I ask this, what do you think the other side? Again, this may you find useful, so I thought the best way to learn is to ask the most stupid questions. And I figured out that uh, those, uh, and no offense intended, primarily people in, in business journalism, what they do, they don't get into uh, understanding this, they just go back to the office and they, they just write, so and so said it, so and so said it, so and so said it. So, but I am not a person who will take it for granted that somebody said it and I have to accept it and I have to write about it. So I thought, no, let me ask all the stupid questions. And by asking the stupid questions, what I said that common sense and curiosity, I tried to figure out that it's very, very interesting. You know, this connecting the dots and seeing the linkages with the dry finance and our life, our maid servant's life, our driver's life. Uh, and
and the larger economy and what's happening in US, what's happening in China, what's happening in, in London. Uh, so, and you come back today, now again the same thing, what's happening in China, what's happening in UK, the Brexit, what's happening in US, uh, uh, rate hikes and the inflation and the monsoon projections and the uh, prices of food and pulses and the uh, minimum support price uh, everything are actually it's, a, it's a, you know integrated so we need to see and it's just you know opening one window after a window after a window so i used to get very excited even now i'm very excited so that that's what that is what i think kept me going just to understand things and of course there is there are, there are opportunities to meet interesting people uh, both here and overseas and whole end up training here and there but the basic thing is uh, what uh, Shakti also was continuously saying that asking questions and let's not be negative about problems. Uh, I mean, we talk about problems only keeping mind in solution, and that's in a broader term I'm talking about. Some of us have this habit of you know armchair critics, just everything is rubbish and problem. But I think if we, if we don't have any solution, uh, I mean, whether it's a physical solution or intellectual solution, uh, we have no business to talk about any problems. So and all the uh, looking at the problems and finding solutions and asking questions, even sometimes stupid questions, come from these two C's. Again, I repeat, uh, it's it's the common sense and curiosity. Uh, and then what happens is this: by nature, probably I'm a slightly, uh, you know, it's uh, and I think all of you, particularly your generation, we are pretty restless and we always look for intellectual stimulation. I mean, what we do, you, you become you become very, you know, it, the job become very monotonous. And particularly in journalism in India, what happens when you become a senior, uh, it is less journalistic work and more managerial work. So people uh, under you, first 10 or 15, then 20, then 60, then 100, and they are in different parts of, of India. Uh, so you continuously monitor the work. And people in uh, younger people are not, not everybody is very dedicated. You know, they look for always opportunities and look for a little more money. They only settle down and start learning things when they are in their late twenties or early thirties. Probably they have got married, probably they got a kid, probably they bought a house and a car. So the EMI starts. Then the pressure of fear of losing jobs, etc. And they are being forced to under to learn things and, and to become dedicated and all. But till such time, in, in banking parlance, I'll say in the early of part of the career, many people are speculators. And only later they become investors. So in your early 20s, when you have 20 guys working in their 20s, they always look for a better job, 2,000 rupees more or 5,000 rupees more. So it's it's it saps your energy and it's become very monotonous, you know, calling up. And journalism is one profession which differentiates. It's not very difficult. It's not you know we are not God's gift to the mankind. Nothing like that. It's like any other profession. Uh, a journalist, I mean, like a doctor, like a lawyer, or anything else. But the only difference between journalism and any other profession is this. In any other profession, you are being evaluated probably monthly, quarterly, for teachers even yearly, that how many students have done well and all. But in journalism, you are being evaluated every day because you have no place to hide. Next morning, what you have done and what competition has done is very clear. Either you are a winner or you are a loser. So 365 days on every day you are being evaluated. So it's, it is very, very important and critical to keep your spirit up. Many people, even though they are successfully doing this, but they get burnt out and they look for other opportunities, join corporates, becomes communications professionals, so on and so forth. Many people fail and become, go, go other way and all also. So then how do you keep your, the challenge is how do you keep your spirit up? How do you make your day, every day different and interesting? So there are ways of doing it. Some people may, may find that yes, managing people is the stimulation. But for me, uh, doing newer things was the, was the interesting part. So I first started looking into TV and I did some TV programs, ran some shows on, with the bankers and all. Uh, then I started doing uh, some financial sector related seminars uh, in my previous paper, Business Standard in Mint now 10 years in Mumbai, in Singapore, some global talks and all. And then I started writing books. I got, a, uh, no, I started doing uh, first a few chapters in different books, like Oxford book on Indian economy. I had written a couple of chapters there and some other books and all. And then when the publishers approached me to write, uh, take a full-time job for books, I thought, why not? So I used to take two months off from my 
which in, in Mint we had a system called book leave. If you work for five years minimum and if you have not taken any other leave, you are entitled to take uh, leave up to two months as a book leave to write a book. So that's how my first book was born with uh, P. Chidambaram, then finance minister, launched the book. Uh, it's called A Bank for the Park and it has done reasonably well. I got invitations from different parts of the world to talk about it, etc. Et uh, and then uh, I got into the second book, Sahara, which is a sort of expose. That's a long story. They were very upset. They filed a 200 court defamation suit against me. I had to fight it in, in High Court and then Supreme Court and then got into a settlement. And this gentleman was in behind the bar by that time. And then the Bandhan book came up. And uh, so what I do now, I have given up my day job, uh, so which means I remain with Mint, but uh, at, a, at a policy level, I write a column, it's called Bankers Trust, every Monday. Every Monday for sure, and then occasionally on some special occasions. And I also do certain other things for Mint. Uh, then I write my books, then I do this kind of sessions everywhere, and, uh, no, in, in India and overseas. And also, I am associated with a bank which uh, Aman spoke about, Bandhan Bank, which is a very unique example of microfinance becoming a bank in India. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So there I do a, uh, as an advisor on strategy. Uh, so I think that's my journey. I think, yes, I'm stuck to my deadline. Uh, so let's now talk about uh, Bandhan, the model, and how it is different from others. Uh, we'll maybe we'll, I, I would like uh, the, the small short film for five minutes. It will give you a sense what is it. Then we'll probably talk about half an hour or so. And the rest of it, uh, we can have a little bit of interaction if you have any anything you ask me. OK? You want me to get up from here to break down the screen? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think I'll come down there, Hello. sit for uh, five minutes or four minutes, and then I'll come up again. Thank you. Mary? Mary Bonfi Bodo. In a period of great financial illiteracy, it's refreshing to have a book written by somebody very literate about matters relating to finance. And I urge you to read the book and learn for yourself what has happened in the last 20 years. Someone's uh, inimitable uh, style of writing, which is direct to the point and always uh, you know, what I call newsworthy, you know, that uh, it uh, keeps you uh, engaged. Sahara, the untold story of Bandhan Bank. Much disputed book is finally set to release soon. A book which talks about 30 years of Subrutha Roy and Sahara is set to bring to four a whole new saga. The book has details of closed door conversations of Subrutha Bor. Roy, here's Tamil Bandhapadhyay, the author of the book. Ara India Parivar has not been happy with the content of the book. They had strong reservations. It is a journalistic work. And uh, I can I can tell you I have not compromised on my ethics and integrity and honesty. Every character in this book is real. You must be wondering what am I doing at the Dadar Sabji Market in Mumbai? Well, in a similar market at Shobabaja, North Kolkata. The idea of Bandhan was born sometime in the late 1990s. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, the founder of Bandhan, was watching women sabji sellers at the market, taking money 500 rupees each from a man on his bike every morning and giving him rupees 5 on the spot. The same gentleman would come back in the evening to collect his 500 rupees. Ghosh wondered. Why were they paying so much of interest? Five rupees on 500 for half a day? Seven thirty percent for a year? Those women told Ghosh, they are not paying any interest to this man. They are just offering him a cup of tea. Besides, where would they get the money? India's banks would not touch them. They don't have the collaterals. Neither do they know how to prepare the paperwork. And they don't have the time to go to the bank. Here's a gentleman who delivers the money at their doorsteps. That was the Eureka moment for Ghosh. That's how Bandhan was born. 
Malumun, the making of a man, is just not yet another book on microfinance. It doesn't romanticize microfinance. It doesn't project microfinance as an agent of social change. It's about entrepreneurship. Ghosh is an astute entrepreneur who saw the gap in the Indian banking system and used it. He has mastered the art of doing business profitably at the bottom of the pyramid. That's what makes the Bandhan story unique. This is about making money available to the poor who are not touched by the banking system and doing this profitably. This is a compelling story of entrepreneurship, my dear reader. I'm sure you like it. If you don't, don't blame the story. Blame the story teller. Thank you. You know, many of you are in search of careers, many of you are, you have your idealism and rightly so. You want to change the society, you want to change uh, what's wrong in the society, you want to uh, address the social evils, so on and so forth. Many of you have been thinking about starting on your own, looking, of, looking for the so-called startups, so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at it globally, India overseas. There are two kinds of startups, and I'm not distinguishing between the two. That something is good and something is bad. On the one hand, you have the Uber and Ola's, and you have uh, Paytm, and you have of course Amazon and <coughs> Snap deals and all. So they are basically uh, it's an idea, uh, particularly the e-commerce space that you're talking about. It's 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 technology driven and it's an idea. Idea is the key here. And uh, there's a bit of confusion of uh, you know, value and valuation. Uh, how much value they create or are they always for valuation? Again, I will not name. Uh, some of the startups are, are hungry for valuation. You know, they're not listed, but at some point of time they'll get listed. But meanwhile, what is their valuation? So how to attract the private equity firms? How many millions, how many millions come? You will find in newspapers report. And then, of course, you'll find also reports that how investors are marking down. You know, they thought that they've invested 3 million, 300 million, which will go up to 600 million, but now they're saying, no, 300 million actually has gone down to 250 or 200. So there have been happening also. There are failures also, and uh, so on and so forth. So um, there is a sort of, as I said, ambivalence. I don't have the answer. Uh, what they stand for? Is it for value or is it for valuation? And then you have other entrepreneurship, and Bandhan is one example is this. Here it's something very tangible, you can feel. You can feel how many people are getting benefit. You can feel how many people's lives have been changing. You can feel how many people are getting uh, employment. So I belong to Kolkata, but first, uh, now it's 32 years since 1985 I'm in Bombay. So I actually did not know about Bandhan, you know? I mean, I knew about Bandhan as a journalist. And what made me curious about this gentleman is this. Here is a man who is working in West Bengal. And West Bengal, as you know, if anybody is from West Bengal here, okay, you have a few. It's a politically is very volatile system. No? Previous the left rule and now this uh, TMC rule and all. So it's very difficult to do anything uh, which will em generate employment and uh, this kind of things. You have actually people left. All these Bharat Bhari Uddang, you are limited. That the Burn, Braithwaite, Jessops, etc., where they are metal box uh, engineering company, they are all closed down. It's only there is ITC, which is traditionally headquartered there, and CSC. You don't have anything. The jute and the tea gardens, etc., et they don't work because of this uh, labor militancy, because of the political interference, so on and so forth. So here I found this man, based, uh, has based in his, his uh, business in Kolkata kept himself insulated from the outside political issues and all, and giving loans to people, changing their lives. But what made me even more interested in him is more important than giving loans to people is giving employment to people. 
thousands of people are getting a problem. So, 2007, 8, um, when we started Mint, you know, as a part of Mint uh, newspaper, uh, following international practice, we started with the Wall Street Journal of US. Following international practice, we also created a platform called Events, which used to call, even now it's called CTD, Clarity Through Debate. So anything interesting happening in the business and finance space, we used to call the relevant kind of people. And in a hotel, we used to discuss, which will be telecast on, tel uh, you know, on CNBC or Bloomberg, so on and so forth. No. So uh, whenever we used to call about financial inclusion and all, and, I mean, discuss financial inclusion on this platform, I used to invite this gentleman from Kolkata, that's how I got to know him. And uh, he was not necessarily articulate. He was not necessarily, he was not fluent in English literature, Eng English, speaking in English and all. But what I found in him is this commitment and passion. He really knows his business, what is he talking about. So when nobody knew, actually I would not say I discovered him, but I found this, this gentleman is doing an interesting work and I used to introduce him to the big bad world of business and finance in Mumbai in the form of a bank. So when Reserve Bank of India invited applications for a bank, uh, Pranam Mukherjee announced in 2010 budget that India will give uh, licenses to new banks for financial inclusion and all. And it took five years to come out, uh, ultimately. So this man also applied for a banking license. And uh, nobody thought that he would get it. Uh, but I was reasonably confident uh, that he would get it. And there are two entities out of 26. There are Tata, there are Builders, there are Ambani's, there are LIC and um, LNT and all um, uh, Indian post office. There are all large corporate entities applied for it. And here is Bandhan, which nobody outside Kolkata knew. It came and it got it. Uh, because uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India was convinced about his business model. So what is his business model? Before that, let me give you a few minutes about this man's background. He is uh, from a very lower middle class family. His father used to run a Mithai shop somewhere in Tripura, and originally they are from Bangladesh. So he was born in Tripura and uh, you know, uh, this kind of family, and he used to travel all over the place in, from Tripura to Yugo. He went to his uh, some uncle place who used to uh, sell puri bhaji outside some railway stations in North Bengal. Then he used to sell milk, you know, uh, from cows. You milk the cow and then go out and do those are the kind of things to do, like extreme property. And then uh, he did his uh, graduation, etc. and he went to Bangladesh and uh, did his uh, post-graduation in statistics from Dhaka University. He lived in a Ramakrishna Mission uh, ashram outside because he could not afford the university, uh, university Foundation, etc., etc. Uh, and after that, he joined a company, uh, uh, NGO, world's largest NGO in Bangladesh called BRAC, B R A C. It's into women empowerment and a little bit of giving money also, but basically health, education, and women's empowerment. World's largest NGO. So he joined them and uh, he he learned their lot of things. Basically, the discipline. And you know, it's in DNA, he, he knows what poverty is. So he can actually empathize the people in that particular segment. He, because he speaks their language, he knows what's life all about. Uh, there he learned, picked up the way how to talk, how to motivate people, so on and so forth. And then he got married and then he came back to India. And in India, in Kolkata, those brothers, he and a few of his brothers were running some sewing machine, you know, a um, small factory of sewing machines, where they would make clothes, etc., which will, which will be sold to those company, those companies like, you know, the Rupa and Lux Cozy, they make paniyans and underwears and all. So they used to sell, sell those things to those companies. But as I said, Kolkata, the political uh, situation and the trade unionism, it was a very bad time. Uh, he could not do much on this thing. And then uh, I described what happened in the sabji market. We saw the women uh, sabji sellers, you know, somebody is coming and giving them 500 rupees in the morning and taking 5 rupees. And then in the evening, taking the 500 rupees back. And when he asked them that why are they charging, why are they paying so much of interest, they laughed about it. This is not interest, this is a cup of tea because India's uh, high street bankers do not consider these people great uh, worthy, they never give them. And they are, most of them are illiterate, they don't know how to sign their papers, 
uh, so they cannot do the documentation and where is the time to go to a bank and uh, so on and so forth. So then he hit upon the idea, why not? Why shouldn't I start this? So sometime in 2001, he started, you know, uh, some of his uh, wife's jewelry he picked up and his savings, etc. He organized about two lakhs. And before that, he was actually working with also, simultaneously working with another um, entity which, which was into giving loans to these kind of people. But this entity could not scale up at all. So one fine morning in 2001, he instituted a company. It's a non-NGO, non, uh, it's a not-for-profit company. And he started in the two centers outside Kolkata. One is called Bagnal, it's in the Howrah district. And one is called Kornagar, it's in the Hooghly district. Both will be about 50 kilometers away from Kolkata. He started with two centers uh, catering to these kind of people. And then it was very tough because, yes, there are many takers, but he didn't have the money to give. And the banks would not come to, to, to give him money. So there are days like you take money from uh, Mahajans at a higher interest rate and then give money to them. And finally, Sidbi came up and Sidbi gave him 20 lakhs. 20 lakhs to, uh, as a sort of, uh, as a loan and some money uh, for capacity building which is free. And what, so what he did, uh, there's an organization in ASA, ASA, into microfinance in, in, in Bangladesh. So he bought the sort of, uh, uh, he had a sort of technological uh, or rather technical tie up with ASA. So ASA taught them how to do this in a meaningful way, not in terms of technology, because those days uh, banking was not uh, based on technology, it was all manual. But how to make it interesting, you know, uh, what, what way you do that. And I, after joining Bandana, when he was about to get banking license, he approached me that um, if you, if I am interested in, since I have empathy for his organization, uh, he would like me to be on board uh, and whatever understanding I have a little bit to, uh, to see the, the entire process of becoming a bank and all. So I thought, uh, why not? Uh, that's how I joined. And after I joined, I extensively traveled uh, in Tripura, uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, UP, and Bihar, and all. And I found that how those, uh, you know, those centers, how they're done. Uh, you know, those, it's, uh, uh, and again, it's coming to entrepreneurship, how we have done. You know, these are all residential centers. Typically, um, on the ground floor, there's an office, and on the first floor, this is a residential people. So boys and girls, differently, sometimes it's only for women. Sometimes only for men. Sometimes both men and women. They live there. Now the, they get the salary of maybe eight thousand, nine thousand kind of thing. And uh, you might think that it's exploitation. Is on a, they are giving so much, so little money. But had they not got this kind of job of eight thousand, nine thousand, and ten thousand, they would have become you know some antisocial, some chain snatchers, chain snatchers, and so many other things and all. So he has actually given them life. Uh, they are engaged in work, uh, they are not into smoking or gambling and doing other things and all. And there is a very clear cut promotion policy. So people who started uh, in 2002, 3 with him in five, uh, for earning 5,000 rupees and all, now they are earning in lakhs. There is a very clear cut promotion policy. Now who are these people? He pick up people from places nearby but <coughs> very distance of say 50 kilometers or all or or odd. Because he thinks that if I pick up the right kind of people in the same village, then they will start giving loan to their aunties and uncles and all, and then there will be defaults, etc. So bring people from outside, and they will live there. Now, how does it work? There's a kitchen, there's a cook, and there's a gas, etc., which does Bandhan takes care of that. And then these people in the morning, they have their breakfast. I lived on these places. The breakfast is some, most of the time is rice and dal, those kind of things. And then on their bicycle, they go to the borrower's place. Uh, and uh, you know, typically it's a 20, 25 people at one place, they come at somebody else's court here, they, they gather. And it's a group, but uh, there's, a, there's a confusion uh, about others that it's a group liability. There's no group liability. So which means if the 20 persons are there, in some concepts, if one person becomes a defaulter, entire group becomes a defaulter. But in this case, it is not. If 20 persons are there, if one person becomes a defaulter, she is a defaulter, not the group. So there is no joint liability. But the group is formed to create a peer pressure. So that 
if one person, first of all, I'll be very embarrassed to default, everybody else is paying. Second, if I have a genuine reason to default, suppose my son's school fee I have to pay, or my husband is not well, uh, I have taken him to hospital, so this month I do not have, I, I, this week I don't have the money, so others will help. So this, this is the uh, story behind the formation. So this boy, what he goes, this gentleman, he goes on a bicycle and then he sits there and then he talks about whatever the local thing, you know, education, the, something happened and make them feel comfortable and all and then they collect the money from them. And if they find that, you know, some child is not well, he will pick up the children and then probably give him some biscuits or probably buy a crocine and give him the lady is not well. So that's how they create the you know, the relationship. It's a very relationship driven thing. So then he picks up the money and notes it down, etc. And then he goes to the second meeting, does the same thing. Maybe after third meeting he comes back to the to the center where others also have come back. And then they count the money, they keep it everything, and then they, they have their lunch. Lunch is again rice and dal and some fish in West Bengal. In Bihar and all it's roti and dal, that kind of stuff and all. And then the dining table table becomes the office table. In the evening and after 4 o'clock, women start coming to borrow money. So those are the collection uh, places where the money has been collected. They have already borrowed and they are paying back. And now the money is disbursed in the office itself. So there's the outside, there's a queue. They had applied for it. Their due diligence have been done. Cross-checking, checking has been done. Maybe one month before they applied, somebody has gone. And what are the what are these people these uh, people do? They probably sell vegetables. They probably sell milk. They probably run hatcheries. They probably do some jerry work. Those are the kind of things they do. So people go there and check whether actually she bought the cow or the goat or the hens, whether she has really bought the sewing machine or not. Then they check the, with the uh, neighbors how are they, so on and so forth. So the and the money is disbursed in the evening from the office in presence of everybody where the lady uh, puts her, uh, brings her Aadhaar card or ration card or whatever is there and a photograph and many of them actually second, third or fourth time borrower they have been and some of them are new borrowers and then there is a book there so they sign and take the money in presence of everybody. And this office everything is customized like there will be three chairs without the handle. Only one chair will be with handle, which is the supreme, the boss of the office. Otherwise, all chairs are handleless. Why waste money? So, how many soaps they can use? How many refill they can use? How many pens they can use? Everything is codified in the manual. Uh, what will be the size of the signboard? Everything is codified in the manual. And every year, this manual is drawn. Uh, there will be a guest room in some cases. So, if the guest room is dirty, and if the bed, bed sheet is not uh, washed, if they cannot give the right answer, they will be penalized. Or they, those are the kind of discipline. So it's a very, very disciplined approach. And then what happens every year? They go for picnics and all. Everybody is involved, and they will be asked. They will be asked questions on these manuals. That uh, what do you do if you run out of this? How many money actually? How much of money you can keep in your vault? So, <coughs> So what happens at the end of the day, so they have collected money and they have disbursed money. So they have collected money say theoretically 100 rupees and probably they have disbursed money 70 rupees. So then they are left with 30 rupees. What do they do with the 30 rupees? There is a nearby bank where they go and keep this money. So that is the system all over the thing which was happening in Bandhan uh, till 23rd August 2015, when it was till now, then, then it was the microfinance entity. Now, uh, what was the size of the thing? It employed about 13,000 people. It gave loan 6.7 million women in 22 Indian states. I have met many of these women. These women are say they started with 4,000, 5,000 rupees in 2001, 2002, and now they are taking 80,000. Uh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh 20,000 rupees. They have been continuously doing this. And uh, you know, they probably started uh, with one sewing machine and they have now four or five sewing machines. They probably started on their own. I'm not talking about everybody, I'm talking about many of them. And now probably they employ another seven, eight people who earn their livelihood because of them. So it's a life-changing thing. And the difference between 
between uh, between a customer of a bank and a customer of this entity is very different. So if you are a if I am a, a customer of say State Bank of India or HDFC Bank or ICICI, I say that, and many of us in urban centers, we are actually have three, four, five bank accounts, two, three, four uh, credit cards, so on and so forth. You said I am so and so bank's customer. But this this women, they are not customer. They actually feel they are the owners of Bandhan. Because they think that, you know, they own Bandhan. Because their life has been made by this man. Uh, there were nobody there, uh, and they, they started taking money, 4,000, 5,000 rupees, and then now they are taking 60,000, 70,000 rupees, 1 lakh rupees and all. And they have employed, they have taken care of themselves, they have changed their lifestyle, they have, they have fridge in their home so that they can have cold water uh, during summer, they can have ice cream, they can keep rasgullas, they can keep chicken, so on and so forth. So Bandhan actually give them social status, Bandhan has changed their life, so they own Bandhan. So I have seen people, you uh, know, women saying that, look, I became a Bandhan uh, member when in 2005, and when I was on my way to motherhood, uh, my my daughter was, uh, you know, in my home. And now Bandhan is uh, seven, eight, eight year or ten year old. My daughter is also ten year old, and both of them are born. Now, how the Bandhan has done it? A, you know, it's a uh, Bandhan has done it because this gentleman has his DNA, uh, how to relate to people of that category. And all his employees also have come from this category. And second is, you know, it's like, to some extent, to repeat uh, Bangladesh's Muhammad Yunus, uh, that poor are bankable. If you can convince them that you are changing their lives, uh, they are, you know, the, the large corporations uh, can go, uh, the SRs and the, and the um, others, uh, Ambani's, um, they can be a bank, uh, you know, they, they may not be able to pay back the bank loans, but uh, here, this women, uh, this particular strata, if you can build a bond, if you can build a relationship, they think the bank on their own, they will never, they, unless there's a genuine reason, there is some uh, drought or there's some flood on some uh, death in the family or some health issue and all, they will never become a default. So, and the other thing which is the most critical thing is this, many of the, many of the, uh, many of us uh, being idealistic, we make the mistake that we'll do good to the society, we'll do it a charity. But this gentleman, at the end of the day, he is not doing charity. He is an entrepreneur. So he is giving them money and the spread is pretty high. He is taking, he was taking money from banks at 12% or so, and he was giving them money at 22%. So he was keeping 10% spread for himself. And because his, his quality of assets was very good, and because he was operational efficiency was very good, so he was making money for himself, in the sense for himself and his, for his employees and for his organization. So it's a win-win for -win both, because he believes that if you give them money free, then they, the money has no value for them. It will not work. So don't try to work anything for free. And secondly, it has to be a solid business model. No, it can't be, you can't remain, so from NGO he became an NBFC and then became a bank. I'll come to the bank later, what it does now. So, you have to approach this as a business. If you, if you remain an NGO and if you believe in grants, so today I get a grant from Holland or tomorrow from UK, day after tomorrow from other Scandinavian country, they are very happy to give us grant, 5 million, 10 million. Many of the cases it's free or very soft loan and all. But then happens is the flow of grant is not perennial. You know, you will get the grant two years and then third year there is no grant. Then what will happen to these women? Because they are expecting from 5,000 to 10,000, third year they will get 15,000 from me. And if I don't have the grant, if I am not able to pay them this 15,000, what will happen to their business? So it cannot be a grant driven business. It cannot be an NGO business. You really have to scale up. You really have to see this as a business. And these people have to pay money, have to pay the interest rate. So you don't give them the money, too much of money they squander. If they actually need 100 rupees, you give them 90 rupees. Don't give 110 rupees. Because in people of that category, if you give them 10 rupees extra, they will either husband snatch away and go for drinking, or they will do something else, uh, not. So pay, you give them money exactly how much they need, even a little less. Keep them under tight monitoring and let them pay the price for it. At the end of the day, it's good for them. It's
it's a good for them and it's a good it's a good for uh, the institution also so this book it's a penguin publication it tells the story and it also tells the two other stories which have failed in the same space which are the other stories it talks about an institution which is called bharat financial used to be called sks which is run by mr vikram akula promoter which is no, who is no more there now vikram akula what he did he was doing a bandhan modern only in the southern part of the country but he was more into valuation so he was asking for you know the private equity investments and so on and so forth so the private equity investors were giving them money but once they give them money they also want the return so the entire idea was to give more and more loans to people and it reached a such a situation where collection was becoming difficult and then 2010 andhra pradesh promulgated a law and there is a mess of that so it was in a sense it was he became a victim of greed business was you no know, he, he deviated from the path even though he continued to say that he wanted to do good to the society but probably he became too greedy which is why the book explained uh, of course he has his own logic he said no he is not he was riding a tiger he did not know how to uh, manage that he blamed others and all but sks of course now it has changed it has become a new entity this is a different story but sks as an entity at that point of time it was actually chasing valuation and private equity money it could not hold on to it it crumbled and the other part of it is a gentleman called vijay mahajan who is actually the father of indian microfinance who is to run an entity called basics now vijay mahajan was the other extreme he was too idealistic he was trying to do good to the poor and at the end of the day his entire thing basics now no more he is doing other things but the microfinance entity has gone bust he could not do so these are the two extreme uh, two extreme of example like one is you try to do a business but you become a victim of greed you can't do this you, you falter you fail other part is this you try to address the poor as a sort of charitable activity you lose the sight of the business aspect and you fail you tumble but bandhan actually has done the balance right it has done it is doing good to the poor but at the same time it is doing good to its employees and institution also now what has it done uh, apart from this it's giving so it's giving money to the poor helping them hand holding them at the same time it all you know it has never taken any private equity investors so when it needed money it opened up there are too many private equity investors wanted to uh, be uh, you know investors there but bandhan said look no it your philosophy and our philosophy is slightly different so who are the investors there one is cp and then ifc washington part of world bank group then gic singapore so they are all marquee investors multilateral agencies who believe in sustainable development who will not put pressure on doing things and then what has happened it is spending 5% of its uh, profit for the csr activities now this has nothing to do with the new company law which talks about a small percent of your profit you have to spend bandhan started doing it much before this new company law came into being and what it has done to this it is running hundreds and thousands of free schools in those areas where his borrowers their borrowers are. it's running vocational centers again free where it teach people teach uh, young men you know uh, basic tactics and then then they join uh, big bazaars and uh, mcdonalds and those kind of things it runs destitute centers you know it pick up widows who have or uh, childless widows and all either deserted by husband or husband died and all and they give them some money and handhold them and try to figure out what business they can can they run a tea shop from their house can they run uh, can they buy a cow and uh, no start selling milk can they uh, can they do some pan shop can they uh, sell some toffee and lozenges and all so it has created an ecosystem your borrowers live there along with that you have the training centers the destitute centers and the students and all so you know it's it's so integrated and the ecosystem so uh, what happens is this it's a complete solution to all your needs and then the bank came why it wanted to become a bank it wanted to become a bank because you know as india microfinance is all again you know you are you are you are, you are subject to political pressure like andhra pradesh did some law which nearly killed the institutions in andhra pradesh and secondly uh, unlike in bangladesh in india microfinance institution are not allowed to take uh, deposits from people 
So then you are depending on the banks. So how do you scale up? How if the banks stop giving you money, then you will not be able to give credit to them. Microfinance is a single uh, point, uh, single financial product, only giving credit, nothing else. So if you want to really scale up, and if you want to see long term, you need to become a bank, which applied for it, and Reserve Bank of India got convinced about his model. So it became a bank. When it became a bank, as I said, it had 6.7 million customers. It has about 13,000 odd employees, and it was, uh, it had its branch network, 2022, this doorstep service center they called, in 22 Indian states. It was not in the southern part of the country at all. On 23rd August 2015, it became a bank with 501 branches. Right now, it has 840 branches across 31 Indian states and Indian and Union territories. Everywhere, including South, Jammu and Kashmir, everywhere. It has about 25,000 odd those two step service centers. It employs about 24,000 people. It has a book of about 24,000. 24,000 crore uh, deposits and, and the same uh, also loan book. And it is hugely capitalized. And it's customer base, which not too many Indian banks have, it, it has crossed one crore. It's 10.5 million customers. Now, what it runs, I'll take uh, a couple of minutes more than <coughs> the questions. How has life changed for Bandhan after becoming a bank? Now, there are many challenges. One challenge was technology, and other challenge was HR. Because you know, when you have, when you becoming a bank, when you have the 24, 12,000, 13,000 people who actually were the founders of Bandhan, and then you want to become a bank, you need bankers, and you need to pay higher salary to the bankers. So then, how do you manage the two sets of people? That's that's a very very big challenge. One set of people can think that look, we are the original Bandhanites. We, we gave our blood, we gave our sweat, we gave our life uh, to, in, to build this institution. And now today you are getting bankers from State Bank, ICICI, HFC, Axis, paying them three times, four times the salary. Aren't you being unfair to us? Why do you work for you? So that's, that's a very, very big challenge. And the second, of course, the technology. So what happened is this technology, uh, they, have formed, they have found out, they, in, in, they have brought it to a technology solution. So the same models remain, the same gentleman goes on a bicycle, but now today he carries a handle device. And then Fatima Bibi or Amina Bega, whoever comes, this gentleman on the spot takes the money and puts it on the, on the handle device, and then it is connected to the central server core banking solution, so it's already done. Now, what it does again, it also tries to create savings habit among the people. Because typically these people do not save but they are trying to teach them how to save. It's not only the urban, middle class, and upper class. You also need to save for your children's education, for your children's marriage, for your, for your uh, illness, etc. So how do I teach them? And it has a very solution, like Mr. Ghosh, the gentleman who says that, look, when a child is born and get the get uh, his or her tooth, so you have to ask the person, and you have to teach the person how to brush your tooth. So initially the child will, I will say no to it, will get upset and all, but one month, two months you do, and it becomes a lifelong process. No, uh, you, you brush your teeth twice a day, it becomes a part of your habit. He says that savings have to be made this way. So what have they done? Yes, Amina Bibi, what is your uh, loan, EMI you have to pay? 970 rupees, or sorry, 870 rupees something. Okay, 870 rupees you, are, you have been able to pay, fine. Why didn't you stretch yourself be to pay us 1,000 rupees? If you can't pay 1,000 rupees, you pay 950 rupees. So that person comes and pay 950 rupees, 870 rupees goes to her uh, paying the uh, loan, um, whatever installment, and the rest 80 rupees go to the savings. So that's how, brick by brick, 15, 20, 30 rupees, they're trying 100 rupees, depending on thing. So those, all these uh, 67 lakh people uh, who are only borrowers, they have also started now savings, little bit. Somebody 5,000, somebody 10,000, somebody 20,000, they are savings. So what is the new model of banking? It has become a bank. It has become a universal bank, not a small finance bank. Which means it can do anything it wants, meaning under the banking regulation law. Uh, or foreign, foreign exchange uh, business, or HNI business, or mutual fund selling, so on and so forth. 
but it has decided no, we will continue to do what we are good at and what it is needed. So it is continuing with the same business there, but it is from the bottom of the pyramid it has gone little up. It is going to low cost housing, it is going to MSMEs and SMEs. Again, that is the segment which is not looked after by the Indian high street banks. Yes, it charges little more than other banks, but there is no comparison. There is no comparison. You can get your loan if you are a triple rated borrower from Bank of Baroda or State Bank of India, you can get your loan at 8.35%. That's the loan rate. It could go down for the home loan rate I'm talking about. Now, will a low-cost borrower from Bandhanet get 8.35%? Definitely not. It would be 13 or 14 percent. But there is no comparison because that person will not get this loan from the other banks. That's point number one. Point number two is this: that person for any loan, these are all apart from home loan, these are all unsecured loan. They are not collateralized. They are not backed by any securities. Third is there is a transaction cost. That person is not going out of his house and spending time. Uh, and losing a half a day's wage and uh, spending money in transportation like auto rickshaw or bus or train. The money is delivered at her or his house. So if you consider all these things, there has to be, it can't come free or it cannot be comparable with the uh, high street bank. So it is, it is marginally more expensive, but they are happy to give it because uh, nobody else is giving that money. And it's a much more risk. So as a bank, what has changed for Bandhan? It has convinced their own people, look, you, you are microfinance people, I am becoming a bank, I run a bank, I need to get bankers, but, and they will be paid more. Because they are, they are many takers. If, if I don't take them, they will be taken by others and they will get a similar salary. As far as you are concerned, there are not too many takers. You have to go to another microfinance entity, you will get the same salary. So what do you do? You try to upgrade yourself to a bank. So Bandhan runs nine training centers across India. And it's like a conveyor belt. These people have been continuously trained. And many of them are upgrading themselves to becoming a bankers. They are getting into bank branches. And they are upgrading themselves. So it is becoming a sub layered approach. You microfinance, you are there. If you are good, you come, you get trained, you become a bank. So that's, it, has, it has solved the technology issue. It has solved the HR issue also. So now it actually, in the last two minutes I've seen, it actually it's a very different way of approach to banking. It has turned the uh, traditional banking model upside down. What happened in traditional banking, what happens a bank like State Bank of India, the large publicity bank, what do they do? They take money from the catchment areas and they give money to the urban Indians. Home loan and auto loan and other personal loans and of course the corporate loans. But Bandhan is doing Exactly. Bandhan is taking money from urban India. So Bandhan's 840 branches, many of them are urban India in Mumbai, in Delhi and other areas and all. They are taking money from you and me, from HNIs, from upper middle class and all. Now why people are keeping money? Because Bandhan is telling them, look, your money is safe like any other bank, we are an RBI licensed bank. Your money is liquid, you can take away anywhere else, anytime you want the money. And I'm paying you slightly more interest than others, maybe 25, in some cases, even 50 basis point more than state bank. So keep your money with us. So they are keeping the money, and this money is given to your drivers, your maid servant, your cook, and the others and all. So the bank branches primarily work as liability centers, take your money and my money as deposits, and that those step service centers primarily work as the loan centers or asset centers, they give money. And the focus is on service. So because Bandhan does not sell any mutual fund or any other thing, you will find if you go, I don't know when did you, uh, I don't remember when did I go last time to a bank branch, but those people who go to bank branch, they say they are, they are always being pulled and all for they want to sell this, that, some, etc., some other financial instrument, mutual fund, etc., etc. But Bandhan does not do anything. Bandhan only focuses on their core business at this point of time, that is collecting deposits. So it believes, it's, it sounds a little bombastic, that the banking is a fundamental right. So you, it, it believes that everybody is credit worthy, uh, and that's, that's the thing, it's doing uh, pretty well, uh, much more than what it was expected. So at the end of the day, uh, I want to say that it is not what it has done, it's not a charity, it's not a social service, it's a pure business. <coughs>
and it makes uh, it makes abundantly clear that you can do good to the society, and at the same time you can be profitable also. I don't think there is a contradiction between you. So my uh, I would urge you. I mean, idealism is extremely nice in every walks of life, but don't get carried away. The best way to do well uh, uh, for you, for your family, for your institution, for the society, for the larger the nation and even the world is this. You do the balancing act and it is possible. Thank you. And, uh, if you have a question, I'm going to It's a phenomenal model and it's been a pleasure to learn it directly from you. I have two questions. Firstly, since your target group is not in the mainstream banking, so what kind of due diligence seems to be accountable for them? Secondly, uh, we have seen that uh, many a times in microfinance, people who have taken loan from one microfinance institution would then take a loan from somewhere else and then pay. So that ends up them being in a debt trap. So how do you ensure that that doesn't happen? First thing, as I said, uh, the due diligence is very important because here these are all non collateralized loans, so which is why you need to have grassroots people to do the due diligence. That's one part of it. Actually, this lady, is she a habitual offender? Does she, uh, is she a liar? Does she buy things? Like, for instance, it, uh, it um, um, you know, it, it, many a time it happens is this somebody is trying to get, uh, you know, planning to get married and once she is married, she will be going to some other village and all. And before marriage, she will take some money, and then you will not be traced. So it is very <laughs> important and critical to know the the local logistics and to know everybody. So that's what Bandhan does. Uh, of course, the challenge is when you scale up. Right now, it's one crore, uh, one crore plus customers. When you have two crore, three crore, four crore, how do you keep this kind of due diligence? That's the important part of it, because. Here, more than technology, it's the connectivity and the relationship this thing. So I have a theory for that. It's like a teacher-student ratio. In a, any good school, there's a teacher-student ratio. You cannot have too many students and too few teachers. So you have to continue to pump in. This 24,000 people continue to go up so that there is always a ratio. One person is uh, looking after how many people. So as long as you keep on doing that, which is good, as I said, because then it's a more and more employment generation. Your second question is, is very relevant, and that comes uh, irresponsible financing. Again, some of the microfinance entities which uh, are into building the book and getting a bigger valuation and private money, etc., etc., they treat it like this. How many customers? It's like a, any other private bank. Their employees are under the pressure to get more and more customers. In the process, it, it uh, you end up making some of the customers over leverage, getting into the debt trap and all. And you know, post demonetization, what what has happened? You will find that many of the microfinance entities have have uh, their uh, bad loans have gone up because they are not paying them. So what happened again? I have seen I have seen this. Suppose you are a borrower, you have taken three loans which you should not have taken, and local politicians are saying, look, don't pay back. But you know that this entity has seen me through my ups and downs and held my hand and I am here today because of this entity. So you, you pay to this entity and you come in the evening at night in darkness so nobody sees you. But actually you come to this entity and give back this entity's money but you don't pay the others money. So at the end of the day, as I said, how ethical you are, how credible you are and whether you are by my side or not, that, that, different, that, that differentiates one entity from system sir uh, but I think the main part of the system are the people who are doing the lending job the door-to-door -door lending job so and their uh, their knowledge of the field and also their intellect play, uh, like their empathy and those things play a crucial role so how what is the recruitment process for these uh, people sir? as I said the recruitment is son of the soil but not immediate the proximity and uh, if I'm not mistaken, for microfinance, it's a 12. If you are, uh, you have passed 12, then you are entitled. If you if you know how to ride a bicycle, 
if you are if you have passed 12 and then you undergo the training and other things and all. As I said, these people for them, uh, it is 8,000, 9,000 or starving because you don't get job anywhere else. And initially you will find it difficult, but if you do well and if you respond to the training part, then the doors you, you can rise. So as I said, uh, people who started 5,000 rupees in 2002, 3 now earning maybe 3 lakhs or more. And people who started 5,000, they have also stuck with 20,000. It all depends uh, how you respond to this situation and all. It has mm, uh, eight or so, nine training centers across India, so it continuously train you. And when you pick up the people, again it says that you have a basic intelligence and you can read and write, do the calculation, this part of it. And at the, after that, it's up to you whether you respond to the organization. Many of them, they find some excuse that, no, I can't ride bicycle, so I go away. Those kind of things happen. But otherwise, uh, it's a huge opportunity to create employment uh, for those people who do not have others. And of course, along with that, the bankers are also coming to look after the banking job. Um, <laughs> sir, I have two questions. Um, first question is, uh, so this uh, Bandhan Bank has been a successful replication of the Grameen Bank, uh, which was started by Mohammad Yunus in Bangladesh. So uh, they, they were successful in a way that they also expanded to other sectors like education and commu um, communications and all that. So uh, my question is, the, um, how is Bandhan uh, looking at it, uh, at the expansion of uh, you know, like Bandhan in other sectors, and how was it thinking to do it, like uh, in the same model as the Grameen has done, or in some other way? The second question uh, is related to the financial, uh, the e-commerce financial bubble that you talked about. So my question is basically to understand it very, like from your perspective. So do you think that this bubble is gonna burst very soon, which has been? Uh, you know, like we, we see a lot of e-commerce websites getting shut down, like Jamong and all that. So, what are your views on that? Uh, you know, uh, I uh, it needs a lot of time to explain, but the Grameen model and Bandhan is, is, is different. Uh, there are certain similarities, but there are many dissimilarities. So, uh, you can check it out, um, I can tell you. And, uh, I mean, that's because it will take a longer time to explain. It's a different model. Uh, can Bandhan get into other things and all? It cannot. Because once you are uh, RBI uh, licensed universal bank, the banking under the Banking Regulations Act, you can do certain things, you cannot do certain things. So tomorrow State Bank of India, can it get into all the other areas and all? It cannot. No? So similarly, Bandhan cannot. But uh, Chandrasekhar goes as an entrepreneur, he can get into education, he can get into uh, health and other things and all. Because an entrepreneur, I don't know whether he would like to do that or not. But at the end of the day, as I said, Bandhan has cre is creating the ecosystem with education and other things are all free. Again, it's a CSR activity, but it supports its core business. So it's a very clever way of doing entrepreneurship again. Let me that. Other part of the e-commerce bubble, I'm not qualified to actually answer your question. Uh, because yes and no, uh, not everybody will fail. And actually, you know, everybody, uh, we only get to know the success stories of entrepreneurs. But behind every success story, I don't know how many failures are there, 10, 15, 20, I do not know. So there are e-commerce which have been also successful and also it's, but, uh, but that is the way forward. I mean, uh, particularly your generation and all, I mean, you, can you think of anything, I don't know how many of us have actually go to the real bookstores and I books, you all Amazon. Uh, mobile, how many of us go to the mobile stores, you all uh, again come back to, at your house and all, because it's cheaper and other things and all. But there's a lot of cash burn because of competition. What Geo is doing even in the in the in the telecom space. At the end of the day, what is Geo doing? It just to it wants to finish off its competition so that it has created, you know, it's it is it's brought down the level of, uh, level uh, where the customers need to pay to the extent uh, because it has the capability of bearing the loss for long and it thinks that in the due course it will finish off competition by doing this. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. But at the end of the day, it it it, uh, it helps the customers. Yeah, you know, so we need to see how things get out, and as long as the customers get the benefit, I think people will welcome to do that. So, uh, how many people have the staying power, and how many investors have confidence in this institution? How long? That's the key to it. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Would you take one last question? There are many, yeah. So you, Amal, you yeah. have to the timekeeper so, so to figure out how to. So we'll just take one last question you want to choose. Yeah, I, I, I let you give it to you. Okay. This lady probably at the end, so uh, I don't know. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to ask questions. I have three questions, but due to uh, paucity of time, I'll just uh, uh, ask one question. So we get to hear that representation of rural and development stories is really low in our uh, mainstream media uh, as well as regional media. So uh, in order to increase the supply side of the stories, uh, starting a rural wire service pan India can it solve the problem? I mean, if we start a rural wire service? Rural wire service? Yeah, just like Press Trust of India, they are more urban based agencies. So, can we have an agency which can report stories across the country, pool it, and give it to different institutions? I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not very sure whether I've understood uh, your question. What you are saying is is it possible uh, to have reporters in rural India to discuss rural India? Right? Not, uh, not just discuss. Um, Meaning to come out the issues and what is happening or not. Yeah, so constant part, feeding of. Yeah, rip yeah. So uh, I, you know, it's not PTI, UNI, and all. They are not urban Indian as such. They are pan Indian. So they are they are in rural India as well. And what happens is this uh, in many cases, or rather in almost every case, is this uh, all these agencies they have people. Uh, but they're not full timers. Probably a school teacher or a post office, Stingers, peon basically. and all kind of things and all. Uh, they are there. But what I have seen now, uh, in, in different segments of India, in different pockets, there are people who have started doing this, uh, um, you know, in using the social platform, social media platform, etc., etc., coming out and all. But sir, but the news is news is news. You know, it's I don't think anybody distinguish between rural India and urban India. So you'll continuously see, if you look at Indian Express pages or anywhere, uh, particularly Indian Express, I would say, there are hundreds of rural stories, stories of celebration, stories of joy, stories of, of course, bad stories also. So people do send, uh, people do send uh, their reporters to report, if, if maybe it's a little late, but they do. So at the end of the day, uh, we get the media what we deserve, right? It is up to us to reject or to accept. Now, again, as I said, we can talk about the problem, but we need to come out with a solution in everywhere. Like, for instance, again, uh, no offense intended, many a time on certain TV channels, you'll find that debate is happening. You can't hear, it's a fish market. Uh, it's a fish market because uh, one one person is talking, then another two persons is this thing, and nearly they come out fisticuffs, they started fighting, you just can't hear, your eardrum will go burst and all. So we, we bitch about them, we said, what the hell they are doing? But do we stop watching them? No, we don't. We keep on watching them. And that's why their TRPs go up, they get the advertisers, and they claim we are the number one, or number two, or number three, and we get more clones, and it will continue to happen. So it is depends on us, you and me, what do we want to, what we want. If you are not happy with something, you reject it up front. You stop buying that newspaper, you stop watching that TV channel, and they, we we need to force them. If you think that uh, we need to we need to have more such stories on this, I'm sure there are way to find out. And there are pockets for happening. But media does not have any rural urban bias. Media is, uh, typically has the issue biased. You no, know, some things like in the park thing. You know, you just uh, you create some sentiment, and people get very involved. So you do some other you know, those kind of you no. Know, Jingoism, nationalism, those are the kind of things you do. So those, those biases are there. But otherwise, I don't think, I think rural India is equally represented as urban India. And uh, uh, PTI, UNI, all, all the other agencies, either they have part timers or they send people, even the, uh, even the regular channels also, uh, both, the, both the TV channels and the, and the newspapers. Thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.